Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's event about creating inclusive workplaces for trans and non-binary people, which is taking place on International Non-Binary People's Day. I'm Ben Burns. I'm a policy associate at the SRA and a member of its LGBTQ plus network, which is called Pride Plus. I'm comfortable with gender neutral pronouns such as they, them, as well as with masculine pronouns he, him. I'm really excited to be joined by Oscar Davies, who is non-binary, a barrister at Lamb Chambers and an activist for the rights of trans and non-binary people. You might have read about them in the press when they were recognised for making a top 10 contribution to LGBT plus life in the British LGBT Awards, and when they became the first person to be listed by their chambers with the gender neutral prefix MX or MUX. And you might also be aware of Oscar through their Instagram account at Nonbinary Barrister, which they use to share resources on trans and non-binary law. I'm also joined by Robert Lochlin, who is the Executive Director of Operations at the SRA and the SMT sponsor of our Pride Plus network. I'm going to hand over to Oscar in just a moment to share their experience as a non-binary person in the legal sector talk us through some of the key developments in trans and non-binary law and help us reflect on what we can do, whether that's as individuals, as allies, as organisations or as networks to achieve meaningful inclusion for trans and non-binary people. After Oscar's talk, I'm going to speak to Robert about the SRA's work in this area to promote inclusion in the solicitor profession as well as within the SRA as an organisation. And then we're going to open up the event to questions and we'd really like for it to be as interactive and engaging as possible. You can use the, li the link below this video to submit your questions. And although you can submit them at any time, um, please try and submit them early so that we can get through as many questions as possible. And I'm sure it goes without saying, but be respectful with your questions. So without further ado, I'll, I'll hand over to Oscar. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for having me. I hope you're enjoying this heat and maybe or maybe you don't have aircon. I certainly don't. Um, so today uh, I'll be discussing three things um, and hopefully you can see the slides as well. Uh, the first is my first hand experiences as non-binary person in the legal sector. Uh, the second is potential barriers to inclusion and equality and how these can be overcome. And then third, uh, the steps that individuals and organisations can take to achieve meaningful inclusion for trans and non-binary people. So first, um, before we go into that, uh, I'd like to just do a quick uh, gender terminology 101, because there are lots of different terms. It can be quite confusing. Um, and I think it's good to, I suppose, have this as a starting point. Um, so when we talk about sex, we usually talk about what is determined on the basis of uh, biological characteristics. So things, for example, like chromosomes, hormones, reproductive uh, organs. And sex recorded at birth is what's been recorded on a person's birth certificate. Now, that's relevant because, for example, if someone wants a gender recognition certificate, which is how they can change their sex, they can actually change it also on their um, birth certificate as well. So it, there's a difference between sex, which has been acquired, and sex recorded at birth. We then have gender, uh, gender assigned at birth. So usually, well, actually always, uh, the sex is also the same, the same as the gender assigned at birth. However, you can move away from the gender which you're assigned at birth. Um, and that's when you may have, for example, a trans identity or a non-binary identity, if there's been movement from what's been assigned to you at birth. Um, and gender as opposed to sex, there is a distinction there. Uh, gender is how you're treated in society, is the social construct of what gender and gender identity might be. Um, and sex is usually to do with your biology. Um, and sometimes they can be distinguished, other times it's more difficult to distinguish. For example, um, if you're treated I don't know, say in a, in a sexist way by a colleague, is that because of the gender that you present or is it because of your actual biological attributes? And sometimes it's not very clear cut. Uh, moving on then, a pronoun, well, everyone should know what pronoun is, hopefully. Um, people have different pronouns, uh, she, her, they, them, uh, mine is they, them, but you can also have multiple pronouns. So some non-binary people, for example, will have they slash he, or they slash she, and that usually means that they want to be called by both, um, or sometimes people prefer one. So 
it's completely up to the individual which pronoun they use. Um, gender binary, um, the way that we understand gender in a broad sense uh, these days is that there's male and female. However, um, I would say that gender is much more complex than that. Um, and there are more, I suppose, subdivisions than just male and female. So to me, gender is not binary, but some people think it is. Um, you can also have the same argument about sex as well. Sex as being binary. People sometimes look at chromosomes XX and XY. But actually, when you look into it in more depth, you have a load of different um, XXXY, for example, loads of different biological ways. And then it's also intersex, which implies that sex is not a binary either. Um, and then non-binary, which is how I identify, is when people um, don't fall into man or woman binary. So you're, you can be, for example, outside of the binary where you might identify as agender, gender fluid, where you feel like you uh, have more masculine and more feminine uh, traits, I guess, which kind of goes back and forth. Um, but non-binary is generally an umbrella term, which which where you don't fall within the male female categorization. Um, and then transgender, well, this means that someone's gender now is different from the sex that they're assigned at birth. Um, and often that's to do with a dissonance between your mind vis-a-vis -vis your body. Um, not always, but often it's to do with that. Um, and that's as opposed to cisgender, which is when your gender aligns with your sex that you were recorded at birth. So the majority of people are cisgender, um, some people are tra uh, transgender, um, and non-binary, um, in my experience at least, non-binary usually falls under the broad trans umbrella, but it doesn't necessarily, so someone who's non-binary doesn't necessarily identify as transgender. Um, so it's slightly more complicated, but that's, usually how it works. Although having said that, language is constantly changing, constantly evolving, shifting. So it's a bit like, this is what I think the answer is now, but in five years time, it might be different. People's understandings might have changed. Um, so the first topic I want to discuss is my firsthand experiences uh, as non-binary in the legal t sector. Um, I have to say, uh, happily, it's generally been positive. Uh, which I was not sure, <laughs> I suppose, about whether it would be like that in the first place. Um, to give you some background, I think it was two two years ago now, um, or maybe one year, I actually can't remember. Um, but when I got tenancy at my chambers, Lamb Chambers, um, the person who does the kind of administration management asked me, because on the Chambers board, which is outside Chambers, very old fashioned, um, it has Mr, Dr, Ms, Mrs. Um, I certainly know that maybe 10, 20 years ago, it was a battleground for women to have Ms. Um, I've discussed that with a few people, but essentially the gender neutral version of that is MX, which is pronounced mix or mux. Um, and so when I was asked, oh, what do you want your honorific or prefix to be? Uh, I said MX. And then basically I just put it on Twitter and then um, it got some traction. Journalists considered it to be a legal first. I have to say, disclaimer, I don't know if it actually is the legal first, but it's probably the first one that's publicly known. Um, so yeah, uh, so that's kind of the whole MX thing. And I... I do mainly remote hearings, probably about 70% remote hearings. I'm in court almost every day. Um, and usually in my, uh, I suppose, the CVP link or the Teams link, I usually put MX Oscar Davies so that the judge can then see that it's MX without having to ask. Sometimes they'll still ask anyway. Sometimes they think it's a typo and we'll say Mr, which is also annoying, but fine. Um, and sometimes I correct them, sometimes I don't. To be honest, it depends on how complicated the case is, uh, how much energy I have at that time to correct a judge who you need to get on your side, because obviously the client's, um, you know, the client's interests are paramount. Uh, I'm merely the, I suppose, spokesperson in the court. So, uh, you know, you have to pick your battles in this way. But in an ideal world, everyone would get MX uh, correct. But I also appreciate it's, uh, you know, it can be new to some people. Um, in terms of solicitors, um, 
yeah, I've I've not had any issues with any solicitors. They've generally been very good. Um, in instructions, for example, in briefs, uh, I find that it can be helpful if you have a gender neutral pro forma, um, because then it means you're less likely to get the he, she, they thing wrong. So, for example, if you're if you have a pro forma for your instructions, uh, if you just say uh, council will be aware, da da da. And um, they they can contact X person if necessary. And actually, the singular use of gender neutral is quite common these days. Uh, so I'd say that would be a smart way to avoid, I suppose, offending counsel. I mean, I've certainly seen it when it says she uh, for, for my ones. And I've had friends where it's the other way around. So I think, you know, it's an easy stumbling block, I suppose. So, um, yeah, you can just put they as gender neutral one if you need to refer to counsel in third person. Um, Email signatures, uh, lots of my, my solicitors have their pronouns in the email signature, uh, the, and I do as well. The basic point of this is that uh, you can't assume from anyone's name what pronouns they will use. And for example, maybe you've come across it if, if a name looks slightly foreign or you haven't seen that name before, you actually don't know what gender that person is. So you could try and Google them and try and find out. But then if they don't have any online profile, you actually still don't know. So uh, if, you know, if if that person has an email signature, which has he, him or she, her, whatever, then actually that preempts the mistake, uh, which, you know, in some circumstances could be a microaggression which if done too many times could constitute harassment or something in an like employment tribunal context. Uh, so I think you do have to be careful with that. Um, and then modes of address. I mean, obviously I use MX because courts are very formal. Um, an easy way to get rid of that if you're not sure is just to refer to the person by their first name. Um, I mean, I know some in some I suppose more formal legal settings, people like to use Mr. and Ms. and everything, but uh, that can be avoided by just using counsel's first name if that's what you're doing. Um, and then if your client, for example, is non-binary, um, you know, it, the, all of the same things apply to what I've just said in terms of instructions or, or emails, uh, modes of address. Another thing that could be useful is uh, if you're meeting a client for the first time or if you're in a meeting with anyone actually uh, for the first time, you can introduce yourself. So I could say, hi, I'm Oscar, I'm a barrister at Lamb Chambers, uh, pronouns are they, them. So by that point, you've already preempted what someone might ask or, or might be wondering about, and it's no skin off your back, really. Um, I mean, I, I think there can be some people who say, well, uh, that's just virtue signaling, but actually, when you think about the risk of getting it wrong, uh, it's just a sensible way forward, uh, in my view. So if you are, for example, cisgendered um, and you do that, that also takes a lot, takes off a lot of the baggage from, say, a trans person who uses one which might not be self-evident. Uh, so that can be really helpful as well. Um, and then more broadly, um, I suppose sometimes I come across uh, some kickback, but not too much. Uh, I have an Instagram, which is called at non-binary barrister, uh, which you can follow. Basically, I share resources on trans and non-binary law, recent developments, um, trying to educate people really uh, who need to know what their rights are, um, but also for people who, um, you know, might have relatives or something um, where these things really impact them. And certainly there's a big crossover with the legal and the medical um, because I think, you know, part of the trans identity is that sometimes you're, you'll have some uh, gender dysphoria or body dysmorphia. You need to get access to medication or to uh, certain operations. And sometimes you can't get it because for example, the waiting lists are four years. And so there's been this big um, issue with the NHS recently where people are on the waiting list for too long. So there's always this kind of interplay between the law and the medical because trans is often, but not always uh, related to the medical because of lack of access to healthcare. Um, so yeah, that's what I do with my Instagram. And I'm basically just trying to inform people, educate people about this area, which I, um, you know, happen to be a barrister and I happen to be non-binary. So I tend to know 
a lot about these things. <laughs> um, so that's that. Second, um, potential barriers to inclusion and equality, how these can be overcome. So non-binary at the moment in English and Wales, England and Wales is actually not, uh, I suppose, codified in statute yet, um, but has been held to be protected under the Equality Act uh, in the case of Taylor and Jaguar Land Rover. Um, in this case, Ms. Taylor was um, trans and non-binary, um, and essentially the tribunal found that um, Ms. Taylor's non-binary identity could be covered under Section 7 of the Equality Act, uh, which is basically the part which deals with gender reassignment. And in order to make this interpretation, uh, the tribunal looked at what was said in Hansard when the Equality Act was actually being made. And they said, uh, it's I think there was a quotation which said, uh, it was quite clear that Hansard was saying gender is moving from A, A to B. You may not be all the way at B, but it's a process and a journey. So that's why non-binary would be covered. Also, the way that Section 7 is drafted is extremely broad. I think it says um, someone who proposes to undergo is undergoing or has undergone gender reassignment. So if your gender isn't the same as what gender you've been assigned at birth, then you would be caught under Section 7. Um, and that's basically what Taylor Taylor says. Um, it's not been non-binary hasn't been codified in statute yet, but um, having done some research, I think in Scotland there's a bill which is becoming statute very soon, uh, which has non-binary in. Uh, there's also lots of other countries which do cover non-binary in their own statutes, so it's not as if it's um, I suppose doesn't exist at all legally, but at the same time there isn't a uh, legal recognition of it per se. Um, and I mean, some of you may have seen there was a petition which got about, I think it was 130k um, votes last year, which uh, basically asked for non-binary legal recognition. Uh, some non-binary people do want that, some people don't. It can be a bit complex. Sometimes if you're non-binary, uh, it can be actually more stressful to have, say, an X on your passport when going through customs because uh, it could raise a whole host of issues, which you can probably imagine. So some people don't want that. Um, Second case I wanted to discuss is Forstatter. Um, so in this case, it was held that uh, gender critical beliefs could be protected uh, under the Equality Act. Uh, basically, Section 10 of the Equality Act says uh, a belief which can be a religious belief or a philosophical belief or political belief can be protected if it passes what's called the Granger criteria. There's five criteria for this. Um, including whether the belief is cogent and coherent, uh, whether it's a belief rather than um, an opinion, which means it has to be long-standing, uh, various parts. But the relevant part here is the fifth element of uh, Granger, which basically says, is the belief worthy of protection um, in a democratic society? And does it conflict with other, um, I suppose, rights of people? Um, and in Forstatter, the Employment Appeal Tribunal, um, essentially raised the threshold of the fifth part. So they said only uh, totalitarian and Nazi beliefs wouldn't be protected or wouldn't pass the, this fifth part of Granger. So um, it said gender critical and by gender critical, that usually means um, the belief that sex is immutable as it was in my four status case, but it also can mean that uh, people don't believe in gender or uh, there can be transphobic beliefs there as well. Um, and the gender critical beliefs have been held to be protected, but something like being race critical wouldn't be protected. Uh, so there's obviously a disparity there. Um, so that's for Stata. However, the judgment does make clear that even if you hold gender critical beliefs, uh, you cannot discriminate against trans or non-binary people in the workplace or, well, it would apply in services as well. Um, and the reason being that that would infringe on trans people's rights, uh, well, their protected characteristic of gender reassignment, uh, and also uh, their rights not to child dream made it quite clear that transphobia harassment um, was not justified. The other point to note, which I think people don't always realize is the definition of harassment under the Equality Act. So uh, harassment is when someone, um, it basically offends someone and it can it can have the intention or effect 
of um, of offending them or causing them harm. So people often think, oh, well, it's fine. I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it in that way. But no, that doesn't work, because if it has the effect of causing that person some sort of um, harm, then actually they'll be caught by the harassment part of the Equality Act. So I think that's good to know, because, uh, for example, if you repeatedly get someone's pronouns wrong when you've been told um, before, then, you know, saying, oh, well, I didn't I didn't mean it is not good enough. And actually you could be caught um, for harassment under the Equality Act. So I think that's actually, you know, pretty useful to know because people don't always know that if they haven't seen how harassment is set out there. Um, and then the last case I'd just like to discuss briefly is the case of Elan Kane. This has gone all the way up to the Supreme Court. Um, the Supreme Court decided that having an X on the passport uh, instead of an M or an F um, was not possible. They gave a number of um, questionable reasons, in my view. Um, for example, it was too big an administrative burden or there wasn't enough um, uh, I suppose, agreement between the, the countries in the Council of Europe, um, despite there being 11 countries worldwide who actually offer an excellent passport. I think Australia got it in 2011 or something, so it's not exactly new. Um, and anyway, Alan Kane is going up to the European Court of Human Rights now. So we'll see what is said about that. Um, and I think, you know, this is some, there's something to be said about how um, society's norms of what is and isn't acceptable moves, but statute and often case law is uh, by definition backwards looking, i.e. based on precedent. So sometimes there can be a disparity there between what is and isn't acceptable. Uh, and sometimes you have to look at the international scope more broadly to see actually uh, whether we're lagging behind. Because if we are lagging behind, then um, there might be um, I don't know, some declaration that that we have to change our law. Um, an example would be um, the conversion therapy issue. Uh, you may have seen that Spain recently banned all conversion therapy, uh, whereas in this country we're having um, some sort of debate as, as to whether trans conversion therapy should also be included. Um, whereas when you see that it's been, when you see in other countries that all conversion therapy is banned, it makes you realize that perhaps we're in a wrong position. Um, so anyway, that's that. Um, third, I'd like to talk about steps that individuals, maybe you or your organization can take to achieve meaningful inclusion um, for trans and non-binary people. Some of these things won't be surprising, um, other things you might not have thought about. Um, first, uh, quite a key one is to make sure you have a transitioning policy. So. For example, in Taylor and Jaguar Land Rover, which, uh, which we've discussed, which was the Non-Binary Equality Act case, um, Jaguar Land Rover at the time said that they had a transitioning policy, but no one knew where it was and uh, no one was following it. So they didn't have, they didn't really have a transitioning policy. And this meant that when uh, Ms. Taylor was trying to transition, no one really knew what they were doing and therefore there's more room for error. Um, and there's lots of sites which have useful templates for transitioning policies. So I definitely recommend having that in place because it means that you as an organization um, are less likely to be caught up by, you know, stupid things which you may not have thought about because you're not trans, but a trans person, uh, you know, it's important that, that they have in place. Uh, so definitely have transitioning policy. Uh, the other thing I've touched on already, putting pronouns on the bottom of your email signatures, preventative measures, avoiding assumptions, uh, you can't ever assume anything by looking at, at someone. Um, it's as simple as that. Um, as I said before, briefs or instructions can be gender neutral. This also implies, uh, applies, by the way, for any policies. Um, if you can make it gender neutral, then you don't have to go through the whole he slash she slash they. If you just use they as the gender neutral, then it encompasses everyone. Um, so that's pretty simple. And then gender expression and gender identity. So I think here, perhaps the question that I sometimes get asked is, OK, but if you're non-binary, then what's the difference between that and androgyny? Um, so your, your non-binary um, identity is, is how you identify yourself. Androgyny goes more to gender expression. So gender expression may be, 
for example, at the moment I present quite male, that's fine, I have to do that in court usually. Um, or you could have a more androgynous gender expression, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're non-binary. And if you're non-binary, you're not necessarily going to look androgynous either. So they're kind of two things which are separate. Sometimes one feeds into the other, but they don't necessarily lead on from each other. So I suppose the point is, if someone's androgynous, you might think they're non-binary, but you might not actually know um, until you have a discussion with them or until uh, you see their pronouns, which might give you some indication. Um, so I think that's a good thing to know in general, is that someone's gender identity is generally an internal, um, you know, deeply held identity, um, but it doesn't necessarily translate to adornments or looking androgynous, which which can be a different issue. Um, and the basic point, and I suppose the takeaway really from this, is that um, just as with, uh, I suppose, other elements of identity, for example, sexuality, uh, you generally speaking assume that when someone says something, uh, you take it at face value. And, you know, in legal terms, this goes back to a presumption of innocence, presume someone's innocent until, until proven guilty. And in a similar way, you assume that someone's sexuality, say if they say they're gay or bisexual or something, you assume that, that that's correct and they wouldn't be lying. In a similar way, if someone says they're trans or someone says they're non-binary, you take them at their word for it and you don't say, oh no, but you know, that doesn't make any sense. Because actually, if someone has come out as trans and non-binary, uh, you know, they'll be willing to face the wrath of general society. And often uh, it's way easier to not come out as trans and non-binary. Uh, and sometimes it can be, for someone to come out as, as trans or non-binary, it can be a matter of life, life and death. You know, it, it, it's like, it's not easy in this society to be outwardly trans, for example. And if someone has come out as trans, then you need to take them for their word, for their word, um, and support them as much as they can. Because certainly, uh, you know, we don't get much support from the media, and institutions can be very slow to um, support. So, uh, when you think about how. Uh, I suppose if you put yourself in the shoes of a trans person, when you're a trans person might say, okay, well, I've been born in this body. This is actually not how I am. So I'm in the wrong body. Therefore, um, you know, should I try and transition or shall I socially transition or not? Ultimately, if they've made the choice to come out uh, socially to transition, it's not because they want attention. It's because they can't live as the assigned gender or assigned sex. So uh, I think just the takeaway is to, treat people as humans. Uh, we're not asking for uh, increased trans rights over other people's rights. It's literally just equality, equity, uh, being treated with the same di dignity and respect as you treat any of your friends or family. Um, so that's really the takeaway. Um, yeah, so I think that's the end of my part for now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. That was that was really, really interesting and, and insightful. I definitely learned learned a few things that I, I didn't know before. So thank you. Um we've we've got some questions to to work through and please do keep submitting your questions if you have any. Um the first question I'm I'm gonna put to, to Robert first and then possibly open it up to Oscar if if they want to contribute. So um Robert, why why do you think this is an important issue for the legal sector? Yeah, great. Thanks a lot, Ben. Um and, and thanks, Oscar. Um, it, it's really important that the legal se sector, uh, in our view, is accessible and welcoming to everybody in society, including trans and, and non-binary people. Everyone deserves fair access to the law, um, and people from trans and non-binary communities are often marginalised and may need um, access justice more than most. So it's important that solicitors and barristers don't um, add barriers, um, uh, that these communities can face. So making sure trans and non-binary clients are treated uh, with respect and addressed in a way um, that they're comfortable with and helps them feel comfortable um, seeking advice is really important. I think a diverse and inclusive workplace is also important for your staff um, as it is for your clients. Everyone should have a fair access to the profession and be able to progress their career whatever their background. Um, and this this can only happen um, if the workplace is inclusive um, and people are treated fairly. Um, and, and everybody needs to take responsibility um, and be aware of differences. Um, and it's not something um, 
that we can, you know it's something that we can all um, do now um, you don't need to wait until someone in the workplace um, comes out as trans or non-binary um, we should do all we can um, to make sure that we've got inclusive uh, cultures within our organizations so that all our colleagues can um, be themselves um, at work and and without the fear of discrimination against um, and, and and feeling excluded and the evidence and, and we come back to this as an organization um, um, regularly the evidence shows that diverse businesses are better businesses and, and we can all uh, better provide services um, um, for the public that make and, and make better decisions if we've got a a kind of diverse uh, pool of staff and 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 and, and our, our, our our recruitment is is open and and, and transparent as well so I'll, I'll stop there that's the the kind of initial thoughts and and the sra's line on this i, I wonder whether um oscar has anything yeah um i mean i think i agree with all of all of those reasons i think the other thing is that um uh, maybe some people are, some people on this call are lawyers or some people work in the legal industry but i think when you work in the legal industry broadly uh you know you're trained to think critically and it's these these i suppose these issues um can become quite conceptual in some sort of way but actually what it boils down to is trans people wanting to be treated like anyone else on a day to day without facing uh, violence, whether it's verbal or, or physical. So I think that at, in the legal sector, you have a duty to think critically, to do your research, to understand what prejudices people are facing and to try and address them in any ways you can. I mean, you know, as a person who works in the legal sector, you're faced with any any types of people at any any moment in time, and you have to be attuned to that. And trans is just one minority which is marginalised. And I mean, the other thing, which I suppose to me is quite obvious, but uh, it's better to take an intersectional approach, which means that um, any sort of minority you have to um, be sensitive to. You have to be sensitive that you may be um making assumptions um which you you know shouldn't necessarily make so i think all of these things mean that the trans and non-binary stuff at the moment is a kind of hot topic because people are trying to understand it the media is it can be inflammatory regarding trans things for example and actually what i would suggest is rather than taking a headline at face value to actually do your own research about uh statistics on like uh, I don't know, trans people or to actually look at what what these things mean. And if you don't understand it, if you don't understand it, you can obviously Google it. You can speak to people who you know as well. Um, and actually, you know, in the legal sector, I think you have to service everyone anyway. So it's just getting a better understanding of your potential clientele. Uh, and obviously, as, as Robert said, um, it can be more beneficial if you have a better understanding of equality and diversity in all senses uh, that can ultimately help your revenue i suppose as well yeah thank thank you both and th and then i guess a follow-on question for robert is is has the sra done anything to to promote better inclusion for trans and non-binary people yeah thanks Thanks for that, Ben. Um, so, um, I mean, our role at the SRA is, is is about promoting high ethical standards and making sure that solicitors and law firms act in a way that encourages equality, diversity and inclusion. And that's enshrined in our high level principles. Um, and, and we do this by in a number of ways, including holding events like this and providing resources to help uh, firms get it right. Um, so there's a number of things we've done. So um, we've also got good uh, good practice guidance for law firms on creating trans inclusive workplaces. It's, it's really useful. It provides information about ways in which uh, you can comply with our, our principle six about encouraging quality and diversity in relation, and in particular in relation to trans and non-binary inclusion. It includes best practice around the use of terminology that we've talked about today, drafting policies, engaging with staff, dress code and diversity monitoring. So there's lots of lots of good stuff in that guidance. Um, I think also um, we've got other resources um, that we use as an organisation 
um, uh, including um, organizations like Interlaw Diversity Forum. We also use a company called Global Butterflies to help inform some of our, our work around, uh, around this. I think it's important that we lead by example. Um, so we are doing um, what we can to be as inclusive as possible to trans and non-binary staff at the SRA. So, for example, we've updated our transitioning at work uh, and equality and diversity inclusion policies last year, um, and outline which outlines our commitment to making sure non-binary staff can feel comfortable in the workplace. Uh, for example, when we talked today, using titles and pronouns uh, that they feel comfortable with. Um, we also have a uh, our own active and thriving LGBTQ plus uh, network, Pride Plus, which I'm the executive sponsor of, um, which is another way of kind of really promoting that within the organisation. And we've got a really, and, and we shouldn't forget a great allies uh, programme as well. So really trying to work with uh, and, and include other members of the organisation in, in the work that we do on, for example, our LGBTQ plus um, uh, network group. Um, and, and trying to create an inclusive culture. So lots going on at the SRA, but obviously we have a, I think, a leadership role in this that we that we um, that we need to take forward as well. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Robert. And then and then a few people have submitted questions, and, and I think you, you still can submit questions if if you haven't already. Um, so we've we've got a question for you, Oscar, which I think you might have covered already, um, but it, it's certainly useful to to go over it again is, is how do you say MX in regular speech? Uh, so there's two ways you can say it, mix or mix. So either you say mix Davies, this is my, yeah, mix Davies. I mean, there's really not much in it, but it's like mix like doing a cake mix or mix like muck, but with an S. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. only learned that recently, recently as well. I'd, I'd selected the MX option on like forms, online forms and stuff. Um, but I learned from our head of EDI, Sean Hughes, recently that it was mix, so it could be pronounced mix. So I think quite a yeah, lot of people. Don't I always know have that. to tell judges uh, how to pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and then, then we have another question for you, Oscar. So, how open or accepting do you feel the profession is as an employer to people who are, are trans or non-binary? I guess that's a bit of a tricky question for you because you're self-employed, but I think mm. the same principles apply. Um, and do you think it's changing? Um, yeah, I, I mean. Yeah, so because I'm self-employed, so I work in Lamb Chambers, but still self-employed. Um, I think it is changing. I mean, the good thing about law firms as opposed to chambers is that you usually have, uh, you know, a pot of money that you can put forward for equality and diversity. <laughs> and so actually, um, you know, there's certain law firms which are which are more spearheading than others. But I think it's generally good because there's pretty much always some sort of trans understanding of visibility uh, and more non-binary these days than they used to be um, with these E&D kind of committees. So I think that's the that's the good thing is that with law firms, they these committees can kind of look after, um, I suppose, uh, trans and non-binary issues and make sure that there's as little, uh, I suppose, friction as possible and actually that they're preempting um, you know, for example, like a trans guide or trans policy within the law firm. So I would say um, it's it's way better than it used to be, say, 20 years ago. I think there's still more progress to be made. Um, and obviously, I say that as a non-employed person. But I mean, certainly speaking to my friends who are, for example, non-binary or trans, who are, I mean, they tend to be more junior, but work in law firms, um, you know, they tend to... Uh, be active in the e and committees and i'd say also if you're older and you're, you're uh you know passionate about any sort of diversity and inclusion uh you can also be part of that committee and make sure the change is there so that you preempt uh you know so that there isn't a case like taylor and tokyo land rover when there's just no guide in or policy in place um so i'd say i'd say it, you know the legal profession gets a lot of flack i think for being a small c uh, conservative place, but it's actually been less small C conservative than I thought it uh, might be coming into it. Um, and that's definitely encouraging. I think, yeah, it's just a matter of, um, you know, continu continuing to be inclusive and avoiding harassment um, of colleagues in the workplace on the basis of their trans identity. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, 
and then we we have we have another question which goes back to the the pronouns in email signatures point that you made i think in your your second or third slide and it's do you think firms or i, I guess just general employers should oblige people to to list pronouns in email signatures to normalize it or do you think it should remain um a, a choice so i think for this um law firms should strongly encourage their employees or partners to put their put their signatures and they may, might want to, want to explain why that's necessary to avoid assumptions um taking the weight off trans non-binary people there's loads of different reasons you can you can set out i think if you go into obliging it can get a bit dangerous in terms of there could be uh, a lot of uproar from more i don't know I guess senior members probably, uh, though not necessarily. And people don't like being obliged to do things um, that they consider to be new. So I would say st you should strongly encourage your your colleagues and your employees to do it because that shows active allyship. Uh, and it also just, in my view, is good practice. Um, but obliging everyone to do it, I don't think is the right way around it, at least at the moment. Again, these things can shift over time. That's just my personal view. Someone else might say, yes, you should oblige. Um, yeah. Ben, is it, just, sorry, Oscar, is it worth saying that the SRA, we have a standard signature, but we've also adopted um, um, the, the pronouns, uh, but in a voluntary way. So, um, mm. and, and see this as a personal choice of staff um, um, and not something that we're requiring everyone to, to, to do. Um, and allies are free, like you say, mm. um, to share their pronouns if they want, but we're not we're not enforcing it or, or requiring people to. It's a voluntary approach. And I think that's really um, been welcomed by, by certainly by the group I uh, work with, the LGBTQ plus group in the organisation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think it's been a really good step forward. And I, when, when we made the decision or the decision was made, I remember, spoke to a couple of people who um, aren't, I guess uh, aren't non-binary or trans, but they come from cultures where their name is gender neutral. So they would often get misgendered when people would email them when they hadn't met them and stuff. So it, it's not just a, a kind of an organizational thing that can only benefit trans and non-binary communities. It, it, it is wider than that, I, th I guess, touching on the points that have been made about intersectionality. Um, yeah. I guess I, I guess a question I, I had Oscar was if you had any tips because accidental misgendering does happen and I think in, in my experience knowing knowing trans and non-binary people it, it can actually be more likely to happen when you've known someone for a really long time and they've transitioned so you have those mm -hmm. memories of them before they transitioned mm -hmm. you can kind of slip into those memories and accidentally misgender them even though your kind of mental like concept of them if that's the right term to use is very much in line with with their their identity Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you have any tips for you know, what to do if you accidentally misgender someone and, and maybe how you respond when when you're accidentally misgendered. Yeah, I would say um, there's a very easy way to do it. So it depends at what point you realize you've misgendered the person. If you if so someone who I've known, I don't know, a family member uh, says he and then uh, and then immediately realizes for me, uh, what I would recommend is that they would say he, oh sorry, they, and then move on. Um, and so just like continue and then just try and remember that it's they rather than he. Um, if you then remember, like retrospectively, I suppose, um, ultimately it's up to you, but I would probably appreciate if someone just in a very understated way said, oh sorry, uh, I think I said he earlier, obviously meant they. And that's where you leave it. But like, you don't want to make a big song and dance about it because ultimately that could cause like me embarrassment and I wouldn't necessarily appreciate that. So it's all about correcting the mistake in a very simple but quick way. Um, he, oh sorry, I mean they, or he, sorry, they. You know, it's literally as simple as that. Um, and if you remember later, then obviously, you know, well, I guess it depends how much later it is. Um, if it was the same day, maybe i'll appreciate it if someone corrects themselves but obviously if there's loads of people around like you don't necessarily have to also when you're correcting yourself it's probably better to do it on a one-on-one -on -one rather than uh like in in public but then if you're doing it right at that po at that time 
probably they is better because otherwise people will hear he uh, for me at least and then they'll do it wrong so yeah I think that's probably the most sensible way to do it it's just about not having a flap and uh, just like being remaining calm and just correcting yourself when you can um, because inevitably if someone corrects and them, corrects themselves I'll be like oh yeah don't worry it's fine um, but if they don't correct themselves and they keep on doing it wrong I will remember that um and you know i might have to call them up on it but it's less energy and less annoying for me if i don't have to do that yeah 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 i would agree definitely about the not not creating a flat um yeah. i could have said it much more eloquently but that, <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah um and then i i think we're, we're pretty much at the end of the the event but there was just a, a final question if there are any good sources to help um organizations and I guess individuals learn review their approaches and their policies I think you touched on this a little bit but it's a nice thing to finish off with I think yeah um few that spring to mind so transactual transactual uh, is a very good uh charity who does lots of work and on their website if you look at it they have like a legal section and then a medical section uh and it basically explains various things i think they have <laughs> access to policies there's also the interlaw diversity forum which some of your law firms might be a member of and i think that's run by daniel winterfeld qc and he i think has some template guides um on like trans policies and stuff like this so that's a good place to look um and then the other places like stonewall obviously they have they have resources which are free mermaids also has some although this is usually to do with under 18s um so those are the main ones that spring to mind but i mean also if you just type in uh you know transitioning policy guide there will probably be loads of different versions that come up and obviously you can adapt it uh, you can get specialist help. You can get me to help you if you want. I've drafted some of these guides um, in terms of actually making it a modern, up-to-date working guide, which for your law firm, uh, you know, can can be helpful. Yeah, that that that's great. That's all really helpful. There are a couple there that I I hadn't heard of, so I'll definitely check them out. Um, so we're, we're just a couple of minutes over the, the kind of given time. So I, I think I'd like to thank Oscar and Robert um, for taking part. It's been a really, really interesting, insightful um, talk. I think it's really, um, I'm really pleased that we could mark, mark non-binary day um, with this event. Um, so again, thank, thank you, Oscar. Thank you, Robert. Um, there is a Thank link to wider me. resources. <laughs> oh, sorry, got across you. There is a link uh, to wider resources on some of these issues below the video, um, and obviously Oscar's just just run through some others. Um, and we do really value people's feedback on these sessions, which which helps us plan future webinars. Um, so if you could complete the short feedback form. Um, and there's a link below the video, that would be great. And and yeah, just to finish by saying thank you. Thank you again. Right. Um, thank thank you. And and can I just say I learned a lot from Oscar today and appreciate them sharing their experience with us. I, I think it's the best way for us to understand how we can all be better allies and, and, and that's certainly something we will want to do. So thank you, Oscar. Yeah, thank you for having me and thank you everyone for listening.